Welcome to Vanguard, a podcast of radical traditionalism. Here's your host, Richard Spencer. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Vanguard. And welcome back as well, Jonathan Bowden. How are you, Jonathan? Yes, hello. I'm very well. Thanks for having me on again. Quite good. Well, today we're going to talk about the philosophy of Oswald Spengler. And in these podcasts, we've talked uh, quite a bit about philosophers who are interest to the, the new right or the alternative right, white nationalist, you know, whatever you want to call us. And uh, we, we've talked about Nietzsche in particular. And you know, Nietzsche is an interesting case in the sense that despite the fact that he has quite a few unfashionable ideas uh, it, from the standpoint of uh, our you know, enlightened modern age, uh, it, it, but nevertheless, he's still quite popular. Uh, libraries, bookstores are, are well stocked with titles on Nietzsche. Spengler, on the other hand, um, who equaled or surpassed uh, Nietzsche's popularity in, in Central Europe in his own time, uh, has gone down the memory hole in a way. Uh, it's hard to find a book by Spengler at your uh, local bookstore, uh, e- even a large one. Um, and I, uh, though I, I think a lot of people have heard about him, or they have some general notion that he was, you know, a pessimistic German or something like this. Uh, they don't really know a lot about the man and his philosophy. So uh, we hope we can uh, increase the level of understanding, certainly with this discussion today. Um, Jonathan, the way I wanted to start out this talk about Spengler and the philosophy of history um, is at a very basic level of understanding. And, um, you know, I was thinking uh, before we uh, started this conversation that this idea of linear history is one that is really powerful for people. Uh, and it, it also, it, it has something to do with Christianity in a way, but uh, but it, it's also something that's survived well into the post-Christian West. And, and that is what I mean by linear history is what maybe could be uh, described in just a, sim- a simple phrase like, it keeps getting better all the time. This notion that, you know, we had, it, you know, we're, we're the next step in history. And uh, this history leads to greater freedom, greater liberation, greater understanding, uh, greater technology, uh, so on and so forth. And that, yes, there might be some bad things that happen along the way, but those are kind of speed bumps along this highway towards utopia or, or something like that. And, and I think if we look at the world from the standpoint of technology, uh, perhaps that, that is true. You know, we, we've had the, the creation of, of medicines, the, uh, uh, from you know the uh, automobile to the you know iPhone or whatever you know obviously there, there is a way that uh, things have been getting better they've been slowly perfected uh, but of course culture um, and civilization these are two very different things uh, than technology and so Jonathan maybe we can talk a little bit about that just to get this um, to get this conversation started and to get our, our listeners minds the wheels turning so to speak about the philosophy of history is just to think about that powerful <laughs> assumption uh, that it seems that everyone in the modern West, uh, maybe even the modern world, left and right, both have, and that is of linear history and how Spengler is really challenging that. So so what do you think about that idea, Jonathan? Yeah, I think that's a good way in. Uh, Spengler is a cosmologist of history. Mm-hmm. He's a botanist of history in a way. He sees... Uh, human cultures and their attendant civilizations, very much like the illogical strata or the morphology of plant life, where they think have a natural cycle, even a diurnal or seasonal one. They have a, a brief flowering, they have a spring, they have a summer, they have an autumnal phase, then they have a winter of the soul, and then they die. They literally atrophy and die. Hmm. And his belief in the death of great cultures, that cultures can be seen to come to an end, 
or they can lie fallow for enormously long periods prior to some renaissance or kickstart, is deeply troubling to the modern mind, which is addicted to the idea of progress and progressivism, whatever its standpoint. Spengler's emotional register was profoundly melancholic and pessimistic, and he once famously in Man and Technic said that um, optimism is cowardice. <laughs> and there is a degree to which his view of history, which is these radial circles that overlap with each other, rather like a Venn diagram in mathematics, a science with which he was familiar, um, accords very much with his own view that things are cyclic and circular and tend back upon themselves and cultures go through various stages which are inevitable and each stage follows from the other one and has the seeds of death in its own mouth in the sense that the thing will turn to a circle on itself. The great culture will decline away to merely being of archival and archaeological interest. These are forbidding and sort of almost totalitarian uh, insights of pessimism, Mm -hmm. which don't accord easily with the 20th century. If you look at a book like Neil Ferguson's The War of the World, for example, which is an analysis of the extreme violence in Western and global society in the century of the masses, the 20th century, that's a modern book. It's an apocalyptic book. It's a book which in some ways is opposed to the idea that things are getting better and better. Mm -hmm. Yet yet at the same time, it doesn't feel emotionally pessimistic, despite the fact that it's dealing on the whole with pessimistic criteria. So Ferguson remains an optimist and a sort of bellatrist of um, liberal um, methodology. Uh, the belief that things can get better, even if they turn out for the worst at a particular time, which he wishes to express. Spengler would have no um, truck with that. Spengler believes that cultures are sort of caged in a way and will wither and die and effloresce just as they sprout up to beauty um, in accordance with the rhythm which is closer to that of biological life than human affairs. Before we get into his, his organic concept of history, um, let's talk a little bit about his milieu, you know, where where he was coming from. Um, and I, I would like to talk about his the, the milieu of his in his life in, in Germany at the um, uh, first quarter, first half of the century, 20th century. Uh, but before that, uh, I think it's it's worthwhile just looking at going back a little bit to the 19th century and some of the philosophies of history which preceded Spangler's. And I'm thinking, of course, of Hegel and uh, Kant, uh, probably the two biggest figures uh, in that uh, in, in that phil- philosophical school. Um, so maybe you could just mention um, wh- what are some of the ways that that Hegel. Uh, probably the most well-known influenced uh, Spengler. Uh, and in particular, obviously Hegel had a, uh, a dialectical view of history, which is certainly more complicated than the kind of it's getting better all the time linear view. Uh, but it, at the non- at nevertheless, it was a progressive uh, view of history. He actually felt that actually history was kind of coming to an end and with the uh, with the Prussian state and so on and so forth. But um, so what do you think about the, say, the influence of some of these great German idealist thinkers uh, that, that came before Spangler and how that impacted his uh, notion of the decline of the West? Yes, I think that um, they obviously affected him deeply um, because they looked for systematic answers. Right. Unlike the Neo-Kantian school that said there is no plan for history and that all attempts to find a plan in history are artistic and subjective and therefore historically worthless. Mm-hmm. It's important to realise that for a proportion of critics, Spengler has not just been an asthma, but has been fundamentally mysterious. Mm-hmm. Because there are quite a, philosoph- a few philosophical schools that believe, whether it's on the left with Toynbee or it's on the right with Spengler, that it's utterly pointless to have attempts at historical analysis which are non-linear mm-hmm. 
mm-hmm. and which seek for an answer to the conundrum of history, that seek to elucidate the Sphinx and get it to answer questions about the nature of historical reality. They consider that there is no plan, there is no nothing other than linear motion and the spasm of time, and that any attempt to find a historical plan, which is other than the received wisdom of a work, is fruitless. They would consider a work like The Decline of the World of Roman Empire by Gibbon mm-hmm. to be perfect in its way, because it takes <coughs> the Roman Empire as its topic, where you have an enormous unfolding spa- uh, vista of historical time, and you have the idea that you have many triumphs and many disasters, that the end is partly the projection of the beginning. So you have them almost as like a biography of a, of a society. Mm-hmm. That's acceptable. What isn't acceptable from this school of thinking, which is the current one in academic orthodoxy at the present time, is to try and find a key philosophical agency to history, to interpret history, that history has a meaning in the way that Thomas Carlyle believed that history had a meaning in the 19th century. And Spence is addicted to finding a meaning in history, which puts him outside of several of the major historical schools to begin with. There's also the fact that he is um, self-taught and was a sort of autodidact and a sort of terribly gifted dilettante, as somebody not completely kindly once said. And history is an area of par excellence, which only academics really believe that they're entitled to write. So in two areas, academicism and search for ontology in history, search for teleology, the belief that there is a a prospective future which can be determined, as Marx believed in a totally different way, and mapped out. Those lie outside of Spengler's purview, and yet make marginal his historical essay, his attempt at finding ultimate meaning in things, in the two-volume enormous work, The Decline of the West, published in 1918 and 1922. So he draws on those primary idealists like Hegel, but I don't think there's much comparison, to be frank, mm-hmm. in, when you get to the work, because Hegel believes that history will reach its full, full fulcrum and its termination in the idealistic presentation of the Prussian state mm-hmm. uh, in history, as a sort of being in history. Whereas uh, for Spengler, the Prussian state, although he wanted Germany and the Germany of his time to dominate Europe, was just a part of the West and a part of the cycle of the West that would be doomed to decline as all of the great civilizations, the Arab, the Eastern Chinese, the medieval, were were doomed to decline in their way. Before we talk a little bit more about Germany and his time, actually I think it would be good to lay out some of the basic terms of Spengler's history. And... um, he talked about a, a series of great or high cultures, uh, and these included the uh, Magian uh, culture, which is, uh, I guess, a Semitic culture, and the Apollonian or classical culture, and then uh, Western American culture, which he uh, described as uh, quintessentially Faustian uh, in nature. Uh, so, Jonathan, maybe you could elucidate some of these the, these big ideas for our listeners so that they could have an idea of of his organic um, hi, historical sense. Um, <laughs> just in particular with those three massive uh, cultures. And again, we're not talking about epochs because he's getting away from... Uh, uh, from from a sense of time, and he, he's he's more putting it in terms of a uh, culture and a people, a civilization. Uh, so maybe you could uh, you know explain those basic concepts, and then um, also just delineate for for our listeners uh, what he means by the, uh, the the Magian and the Apollonian, and and then finally the Faustian culture, which he felt was coming to a close. Yes, he thought cultures were um, self enclosed and were organic and were not time-concentric, 
although they had a period or an expanse of time associated with them. He sees the Middle Eastern culture as essentially magical mm-hmm. and somewhat sterile and introverted and flat in the culture of the desert. He sees Greek culture as proportioned and massive in its sort of architectural and classical relief. He sees it as less dynamic than the Western culture, more staid, more sort of fixity and a tendency towards a preternatural order and a specificity of sound. The Western culture, which is in some ways he's most keen on, he sees as a partly diabolical culture. He sees as Faustian. He sees as a mismatch and a matching of things that don't coherently go together in other cultures. He sees it as a culture of immense restless, restlessness and absence of an inner sense of ease mm. and with an extraordinary desire for self-transcendence, which is a desire to change everything again and again and again to make it new and make it work and make the Western culture the most dynamically aggressive culture on earth. Hmm. So is he talking about a mindset um, with this, a, a, a kind of, I, I, I hesitate to use this term, but a collective consciousness, so to speak? Uh, what, what is he uh, amongst the people that is ex- expressed most fully, say, in some of the great people <laughs> of, a, of a civilization? Or uh, is, is that a good way to describe what he's talking about? Yes, it's a sort of it's a, it's a civilizational construct of culture permeated through an elite as articulated to and by the masses within a particular uh, civics over time. It's socially based to an extent, but only partly so, because his, his positions are sublimated racialisms, whereby, although the Semitic largely goes with the Modian and the Eastern uh, uh, Mediterranean largely goes with the Apollonian and the the Western is made up of uh, most of Europe and uh, ex-Europe uh, in the New World and uh, the far reaches of the world associated with Western imperial conquests and settlements, and North America in particular. The notion that they are purely racial is not one which he accedes to. He has a Nietzschean concept of race, which is that race is important because breeding is the basis of everything, mm-hmm. but it's too rudimentary for reasons of analysis. For analysis, you have to look at the culture and the civics which are created by specific races and intermingled the variants of races over time. And uh, pure biology is not enough to describe man's ascent, if indeed it has been an ascent, mm-hmm. rather than a withering to death of a prior and acknowledged cultures of whatever beauty. Hmm. So, Spengler's um, always an unhappy bedfellow for various people because he never fits in with um, people's preconditions and prior suppositions. There, there'll always be a tension, even with the racialist right with Spengler, hmm. as there is with um, the left over his view, pessimistic and um, non-materialist views of history. His intuitionism, his opening to the subjective element in culture, his belief in the wintering of the soul of a culture and its partial decline over time, his obsession with the concept of decadence, <coughs> all of these would not render him attractive to a left wing mind at all. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, the liberal progressive sees little in him, the man of the centre because he's too morbid, too mordant and pessimistic, too professorial, and too linked to a prior theory which cuts against their ingrained optimism and feeling that, as you said at the beginning of this tour, that things are getting better and better. Mm -hmm. Jonathan, why don't you tell us a little bit about this organic story of Western or Faustian uh, culture and uh, you know its 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 origins after the collapse of the Roman Empire, and then how he felt that it was declining and ending uh, in his own lifetime. Uh, so maybe you could just give us some some outlines of 
uh, Faustine culture's uh, birth and uh, f- flowering and then decline. Uh, what was he talking about? And obviously, uh, you know, we, in order to talk about these things, you have to paint in really uh, broad strokes. Uh, but I, I think that's that's good, uh, particularly with a the podcast like this. So, so give us a, give our listeners a sense of of the um, of the story, this organic story of Faustian culture. Well, I think he thinks that after the collapse of the Roman Empire, I think he thinks that the classical world comes to an end and the medieval world, as such, begins. But the medieval world is a static and enclosed civilization, mm-hmm. which is a magical one based upon sort of totem and taboo and mm. based upon a, a stiff and regulated cosmology that is only unsettled by the return of classical wisdom in what becomes the proto-Renaissance and then the Renaissance. And the Renaissance um, inflames the entire civilization mentally and culturally and sends an enormous coursing sort of... Uh, torrent of energy through it, which leads to an unmapping and an unfolding of new visions and new vistas, whereby we see the Middle Ages replaced by a post-medieval Europe that looks back to the classical period, but based upon the stolidity and the solidity and the transcendental magianship of the Middle Ages. Hmm. And it's the uh, Renaissance and the scientific methodology that gives rise to it, which is the return to a particular intellectual inheritance of the Greeks, that gives man this sort of diabolical pact element in the Western cosmos. This is the idea that um, Faust will literally sell his soul to Mephistopheles for knowledge. Mm. He will sell his soul for power over given things for the power of magic almost in, in, in the interpretation of physical reality and his ability to hold sway <laughs> over the physical world with which the sciences are concerned. And Western man begins a transmutation of everything in life, of every science, of every art, of all forms of economic dealing, all forms of culture and civilizational intent, civilizational intent are recalibrated and cast anew through this prism of Christian fire. And uh, this enables the West to set out as the uh, Athenians had once done in a restricted Grecian compass to conquer much of the known world and to subdue it to their own restless tasking and desire for self over becoming at every possible instant. Mm. So the West is seen as in some ways the culture of the Superman mm. in Nietzschean terms, reaching out across the world, reshaping other cultures, interacting with them in often destructive, very creative ways to release more energy, to enhance more transcendence, to enhance more creativity to lead to more Faustian pacts and bargains, and then to become even more enraptured of its own colossal strength and vigor by importing even more energy through even greater and deeper and more residential Faustian pacts until the thing teeters on the brink of absurdity to a degree because uh, the West becomes still enamored of its own model that it can't see that it's beginning, like all cultures, to engage upon ineffable decline. What creates the decline? I mean, what, 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 what leads to decadence? What, what, what turns self-overcoming, continual self-overcoming, into decadence? Probably repetition, uh. and probably the fact that he believes that everything is pre-programmed, like a computer chip, to decay over time. Hmm. You can only go to the well so often. And uh, probably the spread of democratic, liberal humanist and materialist ideas Mm. and the disjunction between the Enlightenment 
and the Renaissance. Hmm. The Renaissance is seen by most Enlightenment thinkers as a precursor of the Enlightenment. But he doubtless sees the Enlightenment as the giving way of the Faustian bargain to decadence, hmm. to untrammeled ideas about the rule of the majority, which the people who put them forward, he believes, must know are absurd, because the majority of men can never decide any question of mm-hmm. any importance amongst themselves. Um, the extension of the, 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 the women will be given the vote and will be allowed into um, the function hall of the male. Um, the liberal humanism that would increasingly disting- refuse to distinguish between patterns of being and hierarchies in nature as they express themselves in society. Mm-hmm. So really, it's the Enlightenment and its definition of the West, mm. which will, which is necessary, because I, in my reading of his codex of history, is that um, the decline is, is necessary and therefore is inborn, and the forces which are there, rather like the illness and death in the individual, are there to permit change and renewal in the future and the ending of a cycle which is natural, as it is in the biological world. So he doesn't see decadence as a disaster. He sees it as a necessity. Hmm. So are we still living in an enlightened age, in a way uh, that 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 was the turning point and were were kind of the last dregs of of the Enlightenment? You could interpret it in that way, although, of course, at the end of the time in the West, in the second volume, Mm -hmm. He preaches a new Caesarism, that there will be a democratic Caesarism. Hmm. (coughs) Which, of course, came to be true throughout the first half, uh, the first, um, the latter third of the first quadrant of the 20th century. His view that um, democratic niceties would be replaced by a much more Machiavellian and realistic politics, mm-hmm. the politics of ruthless real politique, associated, even though he never advocated it, with, uh, with fascism. Although some of his political sayings are close to that of a fascistic yeah. or fascist conservative. Um, that's why, again, he falls between two camps. He's not fascistic enough for those people who are enamored of those governments movements and regimes at a particular time, but nor is he conservative enough not to be associated with them, at least through the glamour of nostalgia. Mm -hmm. So he's he's too quasi-fascistic for many conservatives, particularly now. But he's also too conservative for thoroughgoing fascistic types, (laughs) and that was his attitude, of course, to one of the most notorious governments in the Western world that you lived through the early stages of in the 1930s in his own country. Right. Actually, we, we talked about that, and, and actually the uh, the Nazi regime banned his book, uh, The Hour of Decision, um, which, again, um, I, I'm sure in, 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 in most of the modern mind, you know, they would probably just lump someone like Spengler, you know, on in there with Hitler as... Uh, <laughs> As, you know, uh, e- evil right wingers, but but obviously there there was uh, that that's certainly not the way they saw it at the time. Uh, so maybe you could let's put a little more pressure on this because this is an interesting issue of uh, Spangler's life in an age which could be even described as democratic Caesar Caesarism. Uh, that is one based on on say populism, maybe even popular sovereignty. Uh, but then one that is harsh and uh, brutal in many ways, you know, uh, enamored with real politique and so on and so forth. So maybe we can talk. I think it's a very interesting topic of uh, of Spengler's own life. Yes, um, there's always been a, a liberal qualm here as to, as to why he um, <coughs> as to why he didn't support the Nazi regime. Mm-hmm. Um, he did vote for Hitler as against Hindenburg in the presidential election, which of course Hitler lost. Hmm. Hindenburg retained the presidency until he died in office. And then it was after the Klaus it was just uh, rolled up 
and it became one of Hitler's many officers as he became supreme leader of all elements of the state. And the office of president and chancellor was amalgamated into that of the leader figure. Mm -hmm. um, he also put a swastika outside his lodging windows once to annoy the neighbours with his sister, <laughs> um, saying as he unfurled it that one should always do, one should always um, be prepared to pay the price for annoying people. <laughs> but at the same time, <coughs> he thought of them as irretrievably vulgar. Hmm. And without high culture, very much Ernst Younger's uh, snobbish intellectual attitude towards them. He wasn't so much bothered about the social origins of many of them, which is what convulsed the German old right, mm -hmm. in which Spengler would have been more comfortable. But he was concerned about their cultural ignorance, as far as he was concerned, and the greatness and glory of what it was to be German, seen in cultural terms. Mm -hmm. In some ways, he's too spare and too stark and too elitist a figure. For him, just to make mouth-watering speeches about Germany and German identity, it entirely begins it. What do you mean by Germany? What do you mean by German cultural identity? Mm -hmm. Unless you're highly educated, civilized, and knowledgeable about what it means to be German or to be European in extenso, these political remarks are slightly meaningless. His one intervention into politics when he was um, attempting to get the power for a, G a German on Ludendorff's general staff during the First War, General von Schecht, I think, um, didn't really go anywhere because his view of practical politics as a man of the study was rather um, probably overly conspiratorial and sort of uh, overly verified. Hmm. Like a lot of academic intellectuals, he didn't make a good politician. But at the same time, although he despised the Weimar Republic and regarded it as an, an, an unnecessary appendage to, to the glory of the German Empire, which had preceded it, he was actually not particularly enamoured of the Germans, partly because he believed they were too hostile to other European peoples. Hmm when he believed that the, the coming battles were civilizational and there should be alliances with other European nation states against the hordes of Asia and Africa and the Far East that would be the real enemies in the future. Hmm. So he also, had an almost Nietzschean good European sense or one that it was almost similar to uh, maybe even Lothrop Stoddard and, and some other people in that uh, general time period. That's right. He, he, he sort of, um, uh, to a leftist mind, he's almost as right wing as Hitler, but he doesn't agree with his views. <laughs> That's the sort of, um, <coughs> just as an enormous number of left intellectuals, of course, didn't agree with Stalin. Mm -hmm. So the, there's a degree to which he also didn't entirely agree with the uh, aggressive sort of um, technological features in Third Reich, which was romantic and realist and agrarian at one level, and yet embraced motorways and rockets mm -hmm. and high technology at another, because he believed that technology had become a part of enslavement mm. uh, for modern man, very much prefiguring Heidegger's thinking in this regard. Yes. Um, uh, and also, of course, he didn't share the anti-Semitism either, particularly. He, he, while in no sense being philo-Semitic about Nietzsche, he didn't share the crude, jubating, beer mm -hmm. hall uh, attitudes that um, swirled around the German rise. I mean, which were not civilizationally part of the way he perceived reality, mm -hmm. because he didn't view the world conspiratorially or metaphysically conspiratorially, he viewed the world in terms of these great overarching abstractions of cultural civilizations, of which Germany was only a part. Hmm. He also was a pessimist, and he didn't share the extreme and rather myopic optimism of that regime, which was very shrill, particularly on its own behalf. Hmm. So, Jonathan, when did, what kind of ideas did Spengler have for the future? And um, 
did he see the rise of a, a new civilization? You know, I, I was actually, this past weekend, I attended the American Renaissance Conference, and uh, uh, Dr. Richard Lynn was there, and um, he, he gave a very enjoyable and informative talk um, about eugenics, actually. Uh, but he, he ended by talking about uh, the the world of the 21st and probably 22nd, maybe 23rd century uh, being that of the East and and China in particular. Uh, do, do you think did, did Spengler talk about any of this, or did did he did he believe that a a, a new civilization would arise that maybe or, an Oriental civilization might have a new rebirth, um, or uh, did did he talk about this, or may, maybe you could even speculate it speculate on it uh, yourself? Yes, he didn't really speak of it. He, he, he sort of sounded the <coughs> the death knell of another present West. It was exhausted at the end of the Great War. His thesis was misunderstood. The tens of thousands of coppers that made him from a penniless, sort of living in genteel poverty, intellectual, into a sort of major cultural figure throughout Germany and the West, was based on a misnomer. The mass of cultured people, of course, we're talking of cells in the tens and hundreds of thousands, not the millions, who bought his enormous book and some of the others, mm-hmm. and he made him moderately wealthy as a consequence and able to live independently. They interpreted the book as an explanation for Germany's defeat in the First World War. Hmm. And because it basically put it into world historical and cosmological terms, it exonerated Germany from a personal defeat. Hmm. It also seemed so scholarly and sort of well wrought and was not propagandistic. It was not the stab in the back mm-hmm. uh, mythology. It was not the fact that we've been let down by forces at home. Nor was it the normative liberal view that they just run out of men, run out of material, run out of resources, and been defeated in that way. Mm-hmm. Um, so people flocked to his book really on a misnomer, um, because what he was saying was that Germany's defeat was part of a pattern of defeats that were going on within the civilization at a particular time. He posited the idea that these defeats could be arrested for a time by democratic seizism and various forms of populism for which he had a distaste, actually, hmm. but which he believed to be necessary at this time in the cycle. And in Manning Technics, for example, there's a quite sort of ruthless extolium of the virtues of some of these sorts of regimes up to a point. Mm-hmm. But he never thought that they were um, the be-all and end-all for culture. And so his belief is that the West would continue to decline throughout the 20th century. And one of Spengler's offshoots, of course, is the doctrine of the clash of civilizations, hmm. which was made famous by that book, The Clash of Civilizations. Right, by Samuel Huntington, the- yeah. Yes, written about, what, uh, 15 years ago now? Or so, yeah. Now, that's a Spenglerian thesis, even though he may not like to admit Mm -hmm. to be influenced by Spengler. Some people don't choose to. You have all sorts of people like the Beats on the left, or metacultural left, let's put it that way, like Barrows and Ginsburg and Kerouac, who openly admit to being strongly influenced by Spengler. Mm -hmm. But other people are very reluctant to even admit the fact that he's come anywhere near them and their thinking at all. Nevertheless, the idea that other civilizations will rise, particularly in the Far East, and will challenge the West's hegemony later in the last century, don't forget he died in 1936, Mm -hmm. um, is indisputable from the nature of his work. But he doesn't go on to specify it very much. He deals with the, the second volume of Decline of the West, basically closes on the turnaround of the democratic seizism and the fact that the West is nevertheless going into an autumnal and wintry stage mm-hmm. and leads it at that. But lots of people, of course, take up the mantle. Yockey's views are, are strongly Spenglerian, mm-hmm. even though <coughs> he feels in Spengler's work 
by essentially giving it a National Socialist Register. In some ways, uh, Yockey is a nazi find Spengler, hmm. because Spengler would never take that, uh, was never a whole hogger, as far as they were concerned, and actually had a different viewpoint. That's why Yockey's book tends to be two books in one. Eighty percent of it is a Spenglerian exercise, and then at the end, the 20%, when he basically adopts a sort of um, Fourth Reich, Third Reich viewpoint, mm -hmm. which is his own grafting onto the Spengarian architecture of a sort of neo-national socialist Declaration of London uh, opinion or editorial. One question that was coming to my mind was, it, we, we were witnessing, experiencing the winter of Faustian Western culture. Uh, do you think that if there were a rebirth amongst uh, European peoples, uh, that it would be something different than Faustian culture? I mean, it, 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 I, I, would it be a kind of revival of uh, the West as we knew, uh, as we've known it, or would there actually be a different paradigm? that would be adopted by European peoples? Well, that's very broad. I personally think that if there was to be a revival, mm -hmm. it probably has to be more classical than anything else. Hmm. And has to be a sort of a, a classicism, and has to be a return to the verities of the, the Greco-Roman world as a, at least a cultural basis and a starting point for thinking, because that provides you with a pre-Christian as well as a post-Christian dynamic. It's rational. It, all of Western high culture bears the Hellenic stamp upon it, filtered through Rome and Romans' holy empire, Christianized and Germanicized that came after it. And in some ways, it's a common appeal to the inner tensions in Western man they can be resolved classically. Mm. So that's the inner reasons for Gress, of course, uh, the Ben Wise outfit, calling itself Computer Research mm. into the origins of Europe in the European civilization and culture. They want to go back to Greece uh, with modern technology mm -hmm. and with the, the hallmark of the New West. And they want a new right rather than an old right to carry that project forward even though there are at least five currents of the new right now are separated out even from the Denmark. <laughs> right. Uh, that's certainly true. Uh, well, Jonathan, this has been a fascinating discussion, and uh, I'm just going to put a bookmark in it because I, I think we could return to Spengler later on. As, uh, as, as with so many of our podcasts, we only uh, we scratch the surface on these ideas, and uh, I'm sure I speak for a lot of the listeners. You know, I, I, I'm waiting for more. Uh, so we should do it again. But uh, thanks for being on the show again and uh, speaking with us about Spangler, and we'll talk to you soon. Thanks very much. All the best.